Okay, uh, I I would like to call the meeting to order at 8:30. Uh, SDC Board of Administration for November 8th. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is welcome a new appointed board member, Cliff Shearson, sitting right over here, has joined us. He has a extensive and impressive background in institutional investing. And we uh, very much enjoyed having him at the investment committee uh, yesterday. He's going to make a great contribution to that committee and to our board. So welcome Thank to Cliff. Yeah. Yay. And Cynthia, do we have a quorum? Yes, we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Uh, we have three absent members. I just want to comment. Uh, Charlie is absent for uh, family medical reasons. And Mike McBride and Tom Battaglia are absent for uh, mandatory training relative to their positions with the city. Um, and um, those are understandable things. Just want to emphasize the importance of attendance. And uh, if you're not clear on attendance rules, please check in uh, with Greg or Marcel, and they will help you with that. Um, OK, and do we have non-agenda public comment? No public comment. No public comment. OK, that's always good. Uh, did I say that? Um, OK, uh, next we're going to do the consent agenda, uh, the, which is the service retirements, uh, drop entries, and drop retirements. We are not going to be voting on the training matter because that one has been withdrawn. So uh, I need a motion for the consent agenda. And I have a motion from Karina, second by Jeff. Ready to vote. We're waiting. Okay. Okay. And that passes 10 to 0 unanimously. OK. Uh, next in business operations, we're going to have a presentation by Johnny regarding open meeting laws. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for allowing me to give your annual review of the Brown Act and open meetings law. For those senior trustees, this will be a nice review. For the new trustees, this will be a nice primer into your responsibilities under California's open meeting laws. This is our overview. We'll start with the Brown Act. What is the Brown Act? It's the state law that governs local agencies' meetings. And the purpose of the Brown Act is to facilitate public participation in local government decisions and to curb misuse of the democratic process by secret legislation. So if you take away anything from these next 10 minutes, it's when SCSER's board or standing committee has a meeting, you have to follow the Brown Act. That begs the question of what's a meeting? Well, we're at one today. So it's a quorum of the board or committee discussing a topic within the jurisdiction of SDCERS. Um, it's any communication within that. So communication can be us together today. It could be over the phone. It could be over email. It could even be over text. So what's not a meeting then? Well, anything short of a quorum, so individual contact. So Thanasi is speaking with me. I'm sorry, Thanasi is speaking with Carol. Uh, Carol is speaking with Karina. We have to worry about serial meetings, though. Uh, you can't accomplish one-on-one -on -one what you could accomplish in a room full of a quorum of the board. So uh, in fairness, one trustee couldn't call, talk to six people about individually about a topic and say that's not a meeting. It is because that would be seven a quorum of the board talking about uh, business investors. There's some. There's not really exceptions, but there's situations where it's not a quorum. It's not uh, within the Brown Act. So if we all get together for social reasons and not talk about SDSR's business, that's not uh, subject to the Brown Act. Of course, we can't talk about SDSR's business and have shop talk there. Um, Educational conferences, another exception, if we're there to strictly learn about what we do in this uh, at SC service, that's not subject to the Brown Act. And the way our ad hoc committees are set up are not subject to the Brown Act because they are not final decisions. They are definitely not a quorum of any uh, board. All right, so 
we plan on having a meeting. We plan on talking about SUSER's business, so we're subject to the Brown Act. So what does the Brown Act require of us? Uh, to start with, it requires us to have an agenda. You have to have a written agenda, which brief, briefly describes the item to, of business to be transacted or discussed that day. Hmm. And then we have to post that agenda <clears throat> at least 72 hours before the meeting occurs. Now, we have a designated place that we post that agenda. That's in the city's breezeway, along with all the other city materials that's open to the public 24 hours a day. Since we also have a website, we're required to post that agenda to our website as well. SD Series goes beyond the 72-hour requirement. We post our material a week before the meetings in the committee. We also post our materials before the meeting, which isn't a requirement, but something we like to do as part of our culture of transparency, something we've been doing for uh, decades now, I believe. Okay, so now we're at a meeting, we've posted our agenda, we've given notice, and the public shows up. Now what do we do? Well, we allow them to participate. Um, that includes giving comment, including criticism on any agendized topic. That also includes non-agenda public comment within the purview of SDSERS. So that's why we ask before every committee and every board meeting, is there any non-agenda public comment? And we will allow that, even if it's not uh, something we um, positively love to hear every morning. In response to non-agenda public comment, since it's not on the agenda, sometimes there's a question of what can the board do in response to that. They can ask brief questions, they can make a brief statement, um, they can refer the matter to staff, put it on the next agenda maybe, but you can't have a full-blown discussion for the purposes of it's not on the agenda. The votes of this board are public, there is no secret vote. <clears throat> and the public can record these meetings if they desire. But we do it for them and post it to our website. There is an exemption in the Brown Act that allows this board to meet in private outside the purview of the public, and that's often referred to as closed session. It's a limited exception um, for specific reasons, such as personal issues, but not compensation. Uh, litigation issues, real property negotiations, and public security. There are some penalties and issues if we do not follow the Brown Act, and a decision of this board could be invalidated, uh, civil and criminal actions can be brought, and costs and attorney's fees can be awarded. I want to talk about two recent developments in the form of hypotheticals that aren't hypotheticals. But the first example I'd like to give is <clears throat> there's a standing committee and there's a gentleman who wants to give a public comment and is speaking strongly against an item. The next day, the board has a special committee, a special meeting. And at that special meeting, that same gentleman shows up and wants to say the same thing. Are we required to allow that gentleman to speak again, even though he spoke the first time? Well, there, there is an exception to that. But generally, I do believe this board um, should allow that person to speak. And we generally do, even if it's repetitive. Um, in that case, the city of Los Angeles, because it was a special meeting, the Court of Appeals said, no, there is no exception to keeping that gentleman from speaking again. Questions about that? Second hypothetical. At a board meeting, the CEO, well, I'm sorry, the mayor starts speaking against an item and says we should revisit it. It becomes a discussion because he brought it up uh, that takes about 24 minutes. And then they decide, well, let's form a little subcommittee on the issue. A watchdog group writes to them and says that's against the Brown Act because you did not put that on the agenda. You need to not do that. In response, the city of Nevada says, you're right. We shouldn't have done that. We won't do it again. And they changed their policy to help the board prevent themselves from doing the same thing. That watchdog group still files a lawsuit against the, the state of the city of Nevada. Is the city of Nevada on the hook for that violation? Well, in this case, they were not, because the law does provide 
that if before an action is filed against the local government that they have to file a, a send a cease and desist letter to the board. And if that board or the public agency clearly admits to that wrongdoing and takes steps to make sure that it doesn't happen again, then there's nothing really to fix going forward. And so that lawsuit was dismissed. That's all I have this morning. <clears throat> I, I will say we have done a great job of following the Brown Act. I think that's um, in part because of the culture that we have here the, to be transparent. That's something that we strive as staff and I know that you have adopted as your core value. Um, I think we, we do go above and beyond that. I've seen board members police each other and I really appreciate that because I don't, I don't like to be the little police officer in the corner too much. Any questions? All right, thank you. I, I just want to make a comment. I'm, I'm glad we had an opportunity to hear about public participation because I think I made light of it earlier and that was really ill-advised. So yeah. it's an important, important part of what we do. I have a question, Officer Tran. Um, it might not be Brown Act related, but um, if we get contacted you know, out of the board meeting individually by someone from the outside, are we allowed to talk to that person or have a discussion about whatever issues they have or policy or whatever? Yeah, you have a policy on discussing different things in open. Of course, you're always allowed to talk to a member of the public. I, I encourage you to do that. When you start speaking on behalf of the board, though, it may, may be a concern since you're an individual board member and not necessarily speak on behalf of the entire board. But I do welcome you to talk to whomever you want. As long as it's not closed session attorney client right. privilege stuff. So yes, we can speak to them about an agenda that's coming up in yes. an upcoming meeting that they're involved with. Okay, I just wanna yes. make sure. Yeah, we can talk one-on-one -on -one different specific examples, but as a general matter, I think that's appropriate. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Next on the agenda is the audit committee. Um, we have not had an audit committee meeting since our last get together, so we don't need a report. That's my understanding, and the next audit committee is November 20th. Okay, thanks, Bobby. And so next we have the Disability Committee, and in Charlie's absence yesterday, that was chaired by Tanas. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> there were uh, two items. Um, that we, to, I'm sorry, two, two staff's recommendations that we had to, to deal with. The first one was the hearing officer's recommendation to continue Sean Conway's industrial disability benefit. That item passed unanimously. And the second one was staff's recommendation to approve the industrial disability retirement application of Jeffrey uh, Sweat. Um, and that item passed unanimously. So do we need to? Would you like to move it? Well, I will move it, we'll but I have no button. Where are we, in agenda? So we should be on the agenda button. Is it current item? No. Details. Agenda. Anybody? Where, where are we supposed to be for this? Yeah. We need some guidance on where our button is. I think she's. Are you tapping? It'll be there just a second. Oh, it's not okay. 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 Well, while we're waiting for that, let me just cover um, the information items. The review of the closed session disability hearings policy. The committee uh, did not have any uh, additional revisions for that, so that uh, that uh, that matter was 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 addressed. And then, lastly, we had the disability status report. Uh, the two takeaways are that there is only current because currently only 17 open cases, and apparently the most dangerous place to be is in the police department. So we recommended that the police officers move to the fire department. There are a lot less injuries over there, apparently. So, uh, in the event, all right, still don't have a button. Mm, looks like it's coming along. Awesome. Here you go. All right, no second is required. Okay, no second is required, but we got it. Ready to vote. And that vote passes. You know, uh, passes nine to we're one. On we're waiting, oh, we're waiting on George. Okay. Ah, it passes unanimously, ten zero. Okay. It's okay. You're not the only one. All right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you standing in, and. 
Well, the next item is yours as well, Business and Governance Committee. Okay. All right. So on the consent agenda, there were six items. Um, all of them uh, passed, uh, I'm sorry, all but four passed unanimously. On number four, what we received was a was the presentation from Johnny and Gallagher Insurance on our coverage. Um, and on the renewal, the, uh, the, I think the issue was we did make a, a change to that. Uh, no, we did not make a change to that. I apologize. We asked separately for uh, Gallagher to come back with some additional pricing on the EPLI insurance policy, which was is employer liability. It wasn't actually part of the action item. It came up as part of the presentation. And so we're just simply asking at the next meeting for that to come back. So I would ask uh, the board members, does anybody want to discuss any of these items before we vote on the consent agenda? So, Hearing, we're, so are we not approving number four? Is that what no, you're no we, we are. We just okay. made it, we made it, we made, uh, we just simply asked on, a, on an issue that actually wasn't part of that action oh, item, I see. we asked okay. for some additional information to okay. come back at the next meeting. Great. Okay. okay. All right. So then I will move the consent agenda. No second is required. Ready to vote. All right. Cliff, did you okay. have, oh, there you there go. go, okay. All right, and that motion passes 10 to zero. Great. All right, so on our reports, member service division, Cynthia Queen was telling us uh, what a great job they have been doing there and that her call volume, I mean, the call the call answer time is, is down below 30 seconds on average, even on the busy, busy time, so that's fantastic. Um, Karina, she had a lot of nice things to say about you and your presentation, which I thought was nice. I mean, considering what she says behind the scenes, I thought that was very nice of her to say that publicly that way, so that was great. Um, and then she, uh, uh, she mentioned that the, uh, that she was also talking about the, uh, I think emphasizing the board's plan on governance and the efforts to ensure retirement security. I think it was the two other topics. Um, Cynthia, do you have anything else you wanna add? The annual meeting was fantastic. All right. Um, is there a video we can watch? Yeah. There is. I think okay. it's on the website. Great. Okay. We'll Cynthia always has videos on the website okay. to watch. Okay, that's true. All right. Benefits Administration uh, report. Marcel explained that we received the PPCC Public Pension Standards Award for funding and administration for the second year in a row. Um, they, she also described a very detailed and elaborate plan to deal with incorporating um, our core values that came out of our retreat. Um, apparently, she's forcing the staff to give presentations to the rest of the staff about different parts of that. Um, I, I assume that that's incredibly well received by the presenters, so thank you. Um, on the information technology report, uh, I, will, I will read to you the comment that uh, Greg thinks I should say, which is that the committee had no comments and no discussion. In reality, the committee thoughtfully considered every aspect of David Bond's report and had no questions because it was so well done. So I, I just want to bring that out. Um, Johnny gave the legal and compliance uh, division report. We had, uh, we again, thoughtfully considered that report as well. And while it wasn't written as well as David Bond's report, it was not bad. So we, we had no comments or discussions on that. Uh, Ted uh, was had, had probably the best news to report, and that is that uh, the little issue that happened with the EDD a couple months back has been resolved. Uh, no penalties, no changes, everything is fantastic. And so I guess Ted can, can, can uh, rest, uh, rest, rest easy knowing he's not going to jail. So this is fantastic. And then the uh, 2019 trust financial statement, uh, we reviewed those and as usual, Ted does a phenomenal job with them. And uh, it was, it, it, it's impossible to find a question when you see something that complete. So thank you, Ted. <laughs> any questions from the uh, board members on any of the reports? Any questions of staff? No. Any comments from any of the staff? Fantastic, thank you. Okay, thanks for that report, quick quick as always. And um, next we have investment committee uh, where we are going to have two action items and Karina will lead that discussion. Thank you, Carol. Uh, yes, we met uh, yesterday for about two hours and we did have two action items. The first of which was to reduce the uh, small cap overweight in the U.S. Uh, domestic portfolio. I think we're gonna do NREP first. Oh, you wanna take NREP first? Um, Please. Yes, our, our uh, presenter yesterday had a travel delay, so we took the small cap overweight first. So today we're gonna be back on schedule with um, discussing the $30 million commitment to NREP. And uh, Jamie, if you wanna start us off. 
Absolutely. So this is a recommendation from staff and the consultant. In the fiscal year 2020 real estate annual investment plan that was approved at the July meeting, $60 million was called to be invested in this fiscal year in non-core real estate investments. After engaging in discussion, discussions and considering several alternatives, staff and Townsend have identified NREP Fund 4 as an opportunity that meets SDSER's real estate investment criteria and portfolio objectives. The addition of NREP Fund 4 will provide the real estate portfolio with complementary diversification benefits and attractive projected performance with a fund strategy that has provided consistent performance in all parts of the economic cycle. NREP Nordic Strategies Fund 4 is a closed-end, non-core fund investing in Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. The fund will seek to identify segments of the market that are underpriced due to a lack of competition. NREP Fund 4 will focus on assets that generate positive cash flow and assets where the fund can carry out investment, excuse me, asset management initiatives in order to deliver capital appreciation. <laughs> the fund is targeting net returns of 13% and the committee approved this investment 4-0 yesterday. And with that, I can answer any questions. Jamie, would you please highlight for the committee the fees on this fund? Sure, the fees are 1.5% on committed and invested, so they won't change from the period of the investment period of three years um, through the end of the fund, which is a 10-year life. <coughs> and carried, carried interest? And carried interest as well. Uh, they have a 20% uh, carry after an 8% preferred return. Okay. Are there any other questions or further discussion around There's this? There's actually probably one other item I probably need to note is you'll notice in the recommendation we're adding a... Um, We've added some language to the end of the recommendation subject to a pass rating for the operational due diligence. It's just an item to note. Uh, our consultant, um, Aon Townsend, uh, did do an operational due diligence um, evaluation of the fund, and that's an extra set of evaluation beyond the investment uh, criteria for the investment. This is really looking at the organization to make sure that they have all of the proper things in place that we'd like to see for an organization. In this uh, in this instance, they have found two things that they think that need to have some additional strength, and NREP has committed to uh, fulfilling these requirements. At that time, um, Townsend would then give them a pass rating. So right now they have a conditional pass, meaning subject to them completing this, uh, they would then uh, give them that pass rating. And therefore, the uh, committee yesterday uh, subject um, had a subject to clause, basically, Correct. to passing these two items uh, prior to investment. Correct. Any further discussion or question on this recommendation for a $30 million commitment to NREP 4? I think this is, uh, uh, correct me otherwise, but it's the largest private real estate uh, firm in the Nordic countries. Is That's that, correct. That's correct. Yep, okay. They were the first and also they're and the largest. And it closes up, uh, at, at least in part, our underweight to non-core real estate. Yes, and it's a good complement to the existing um, international exposure that we have, mm -hmm. which is largely uh, Germany, Italy, and France. Mm -hmm. So this, again, gives us some exposure to the Scandinavian countries as well. With that, um, we need a motion to approve staff and consultants' recommendation for a $30 million commitment to NREP Nordic Strategies Fund 4, subject to a pass rating for operational due diligence. Yeah, we don't need it. Moved it, so. it was moved by uh, Cliff Shearson. Just as a matter of procedure, when it comes out of committee, the, no we don't need a second, and it can be moved by the committee chair. Just FYI. For Cliff. Okay. Okay. Ready to vote. Great, and that passes unanimously, ten to zero. So the next action item we had was the reduction of the overweight to the small cap um, bias within the U.S. domestic equity portfolio. 
um, Demetrius is going to walk us through that discussion. Uh, this item also passed unanimously at yesterday's committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Karina. And good morning, everyone. To give a little bit of background first, uh, SD SIRS has for many years maintained an overweight to small cap stocks in its U.S. equity portfolio. And the reasoning behind this was to take advantage of the small of the return premium that small cap stocks have historically had compared to large cap stocks. Uh, prior to 2014, SD SIRS had about double the market weight. And in 2014, the decision was made to cut this overweight down to about 50% more than the, than the benchmark, which is where we currently sit. <clears throat> so at the last committee meeting, Aon presented an analysis of SD Surge's small cap overweight. And there were three main takeaways that I want to impart. First, the small cap premium has diminished in recent years. Second, investments in small cap stocks tend to have higher management fees. And third, small cap stocks are typically um, more volatile. Therefore, the recommendation is to bring SD Surge's small cap exposure down to a market weight over a period of 18 months. And this is to give staff and the consultant the flexibility to carry this out um, in an efficient manner based on how the market moves and what SD Surge's liquidity needs are. Um, as Karina mentioned, this passed unanimously yesterday, and the, uh, the motion was adjusted during the meeting um, to change the timing from three years to a year and a half. I think the rationale behind that was uh, it still gives staff and the consultant um, the necessary time to carry this out, but with a little bit more expedience. And then also, um, it was pending follow-up due diligence to SD Service's existing small cap managers. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I do think that we uh, conduct due diligence on a regular schedule with all of our managers. Um, it's very important to do on-site due diligence with active managers in particular, and uh, particularly when there is negative press, it makes it all the more important. So we look forward to your update at the January meeting. Yep. With that, I would like to move the staff and consultants recommendation to reduce the small cap bias to market weight over a period not to exceed 18 months and staff follow up with committee regarding on-site due diligence at the January meeting. Ready to vote. All votes are in. Great, and that also passes unanimously. Thank you. Jamie, there were also a number of, opera, uh, of rather informational items. Do you want to just walk us through those quickly? I'll give you a quick summary of each one. Uh, beginning with the update on the implementation of State Street's Limited Partnership Services. Limited Partnership Services is a newer service that State Street is offering its clients to better manage its private market investments. By utilizing this service, clients are able to leverage leverage a specialized team to assist with the management of cash flows and accounting for private market investments. In addition, clients have access to a robust cash management system to manage and track the authorizations and progress of each cash flow. The contract was signed in December 2018, and due to the importance of correctly implementing this service, staff added the implementation of limited partnership services to the fiscal year 2020 action plan. After developing and completing the project plan, SD Surge began using the service in April 2019. Since that time, the service has been operating as expected with no issues. SD Surge has successfully completed the implementation of limited partnership services. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. No questions? Nope. Great. So the next item was the performance real estate performance report for the quarter ending June 30th, 2019. I'd like to give you a brief summary of the performance. For the quarter, SD SIRS real estate portfolio had a return of 1.1% versus the benchmark of 0.9%. For the trailing one-year period, SD SIRS had a return of 4.7% versus the benchmark at 6%. SD SIRS continues to outperform over the longer time periods, and that's the 3, 5, 10, and since inception time periods. And with that, I can answer any questions that you have about real estate performance. 
you want to just comment on that on the uh, components of that underperformance in the one year? Absolutely. In the one year, uh, the most, the biggest driver of that underperformance is coming from one of our core. Uh, real estate managers, and that's the UBS Trumbull Property Fund. That fund has seen a uh, turn in its performance due to a write-down of its retail assets. Um, they've also seen a large number of client outflows. SD Surge is also in the queue for um, uh, redeeming its assets out of that fund. So as a result, the fund has been struggling with its performance, and that's the largest driver of our performance for the quarter and for the year. Uh, the next performance report was the Stepstone Private Equity and Infrastructure Performance Report for the quarter ending June 30th, 2019. The combined since inception net IRR for the Stepstone Atlantic Fund as of June 30th, 2019 was 13.9%. <clears throat> to break that down into break down that IRR into its components, private equity had a net IRR of 16% versus its primary benchmark of 11.8%. And infrastructure had a net IRR of 4.8% versus its benchmark at 6.9%. With that, I can answer any questions about Stepstone. Okay. Uh, then the final performance report was the GCM Grosvenor Private Equity and Infrastructure Performance Report for the quarter ending June 30th, 2019. The combined since inception net IRR for the GCM Grosvenor Pacific Fund as of June 30th, 2019 was 15.1%. To break that IRR down into its components, private equity had a net IRR of 16.1% versus its primary benchmark of 11.8, and infrastructure had a net IRR of 10.8% versus its benchmark of 7%. And with that, I can answer any questions about GCM Grosvenor. Seeing no questions, would like to comment on the excellent uh, performance that uh, both of these managers have been able to bring to the plan. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you. And that's it. That's the end of investment committee. Thank you very much. Well, I thought this would be a 40 minute meeting and I think we're gonna make it. Um, so are there any questions or comments uh, in general from any board members? I don't see any, so uh, thank you for that. And uh, questions, comments from staff. I know Greg uh, wants to make a report, and anyone else is welcome to do so. Excellent. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to see everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see everyone this morning. I'd like to start with, again, a personal welcome to uh, Mr. Shearson. It's a pleasure to have you on the board, and I look forward to working with you during your, during your tenure. I also wanted to make some additional comments about our annual membership meeting, which was held uh, this past October 18th at the Balboa Park uh, Club, uh, Club Ballroom. And it was an opportunity for us to share uh, what's going on with SD SIRS with our members. And our theme this year was, we keep our promises so you can keep yours. And I would like to personally thank uh, Karina Coleman for her opening remarks that really focused on our promise to our members about highlighting our commitments um, to meet our mission to deliver accurate and timely uh, benefit payments and ensure the trust fund safety, integrity, and growth. And I'd also like to thank Cynthia Queen for being our master of ceremonies. Um, our presenters I'd like to thank, Marcel Rospin, Liza Krasafi, Jamie Hamrick, Anders Norman, Cynthia Queen, and myself. And I'd like to give a special shout out to our project coordinator, Jessica Maloney. Are you out there, Jessica? Oh, she's, she's coordinating. And also our support crew, which they were the, uh, the muscle at the door and also passing out candy as we did pension trivia. Uh, Luli Silva, Sandra Claussen, Sarah Levy, Catherine Pena, and Alfredo Nieto. So thank you all of you for a, a wonderful annual membership meeting. Um, I'd also like to highlight that ST SIRS is a learning organization that we strive to keep our knowledge and skill sets um, current uh, through training. And this most certainly uh, includes board members. Um, you are responsible for a financial organization with uh, nearly $9 billion in assets under management, taking care of over 20,000 members' uh, financial security and uh, affecting over $500 million in benefit payments per year. So it's a very, important uh, duties that you have, and so your keeping your skill set current is very important. 
Uh, with that, every year we like to put together a training plan. So over probably the next few weeks, you'll be getting an email uh, from me reminding you of the, the training that you've had in the past and some recommendations uh, for the future. And so please keep an eye out uh, for those emails. What we'd like to do is put together a personalized training plan for you and bring those to the January meeting for the board to adopt them. And again, they are a plan for the future. We can adjust it as it goes away, goes along, but we just wanted to try to get that on your calendars and get that commitment for you. So look forward to those interactions with you. Uh, we also provide in-house training for staff, for staff to keep their uh, skill, sets, skill sets current. And we did some in-house training. So I'd like to recognize the following presenters. Uh, on the topic of elder abuse, we had Rebecca Zip, the chief deputy city attorney, come in and, and speak to the, the staff. Uh, privacy training provided by Susan Youngflesh. Appeals process training provided by Johnny Tran. Public Records Act requests provided by Susan Youngflesh, Youngflesh and Melanie Peter. Our Disability Program by Sandra Claussen. Our Retiree Healthcare Program by Sandra Claussen. Supplemental Benefits by Monty Prieto. And SD SDSER's Core Value of Fiduciary by Victoria Fedelizo and Jessica Maloney. And it, yes, it was very well received. Uh, and SD SDSER's Core Value Transparency by Jamie Hamrick and Anders Norman. And we'll be addressing our other core values during the year for customer service, accountability, professionalism, and integrity coming up. I'd also like to give a quick update on Prop B. Uh, in August of 2019, the Office of the uh, Attorney General granted the city unions permission to file a core warranto suit in order to overturn Proposition B. In September of 2019, the city unions filed the lawsuit in San Diego Superior Court and in the suit, the unions are the plaintiffs and the city is the defendant. And in October, importantly, this is kind of the heart of the update, the courts allowed interveners into the suit. So this would be the original proponents are also brought into the suit so they can participate in, in the arguments. Um, also like to highlight that SD SERS is not a, part to, uh, a party to this lawsuit. And we do not expect this lawsuit to be resolved in the near term, So, but we will keep uh, the board and the ad hoc committee apprised of any significant developments as we as we go along. Uh, I'd like to highlight SD Serves uh, received some special recognition for its operations. Uh, the Public Pension Standards Award for Funding and Administration. The Public Pension Coordinating Council grants this award, which recognizes SD Serves for meeting professional standards and planned funding and administration and also the Quality Information Technologies Practices Award. The Municipal Information Systems Association of California grants this award for acknowledgement that SD SERS is following IT best practices in administration, audit, network, and security. So congratulations on that. And there's four operational items I'd like to highlight. I'd like to congratulate Sarah Levy for promoting to member counselor position. There's a nice write-up by Cynthia Queen in the member services uh, staff report uh, talking about Sarah and her uh, rich experience in member counseling. I'd like to welcome Farnaz Farhani. I think there's Farnaz back there. Mm -hmm. Hello. She also helped at the annual meeting. She also, oh, and she also helped at the annual meeting. Thank you. Um, who joined our team as our administrative assistant. I'd like to celebrate uh, Fong Nguyen, our benefit uh, administration supervisor, and his wife, Julie, on their first child, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say, thank staff for a strong Halloween spirit this year with their creative <laughs> decorating and costumes. And now, SD SERS had a strong showing in the Buildings, Buildings Halloween contest, taking two out of three awards. <laughs> we had the scariest individual costume, uh, Cynthia Queen as the candy corn queen and her performance <laughs> on the evils of Halloween candy. And the Why best are we group not surprised. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the best group costume, Jamie Hamrick and Ted LaSalvia as Wilma and Fred Flintstone, <laughs> complete driving their life size prehistoric foot powered car. Oh my God. <laughs> so thank you. That concludes my comments. <laughs> Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want pictures. Uh, okay. Uh, I, seriously, thanks for that um, that update, and it was interesting to hear about uh, the work you're doing with staff around the values um, in particular. Okay. I believe that that concludes. Here we go. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, so 
what do we have to worry about relative to the lawsuit? And uh, do we have to do anything? Or are we just sitting tight? What's the story? So the, the question is, what do does ST SERS have to worry about uh, with regards to the Prop B litigation? Right. Is there things that we should be doing as an organization in preparing for that? And I'm pleased to say that we've been taking steps already. So uh, on a governance uh, level, we have an ad hoc uh, Prop B committee that uh, is working between the staff and the board to look at this and keep abreast of the, the litigation. Um, from a staff perspective, we have contingency plans depending on uh, what the courts eventually decide should the members be brought back into the plan and if so, how they are brought back into the plan. We identified a number of kind of uh, situational scenarios with regards to bringing members back in. Um, uh, so I would say additionally, what we've been working very hard is to make sure that all of our work processes are, are current. So, you know, to eliminate any backlogs of work so that when we do have uh, this resolved that we'll have all the resources available uh, to move forward. And finally, we've done some analysis with regards to information systems. So should the members come back into the system, would we be able to do so um, with our computer systems, and the answer to that is yes. So we're we're situated for success. Uh, well, specifically, I wanted to know what does it do from an accounting point of view to our unfunded liability? Do we have to make adjustments now, or what's what? What do we have to think about there? With regards to our actual process, uh, we are on solid footing with uh, the actual evaluations and the assumption and methodologies that we've employed. Um, I would uh, like to see what the courts come up with with regards to what does the future hold with regards to how do members come back into membership if they are going to come back into membership and how we fund that. And so we will definitely address those issues as, as they uh, become known. So for now, we do not adjust our unfunded liability. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so... Is there any more business for our meeting today? If not, oh, there is no closed session. Let me let me just say there is no closed session. And if there's no further business, we're going we're going to adjourn. And I'm going to bang the gavel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well done. Uh, <laughs>